say, will, will it be so available? So if I close, I can give to someone else? Yes. Do you need to unlock it like that? Okay. So now uh, you can uh, take the uh, give to someone else because yes, I'm not supposed to, me, to start. Yeah, yeah. Give to me. Let me check. Uh, you want that I share again? Yes, please. Okay. It is. Oh no no no! It just when you finish sharing, will the other people yeah. automatically get it, or do the host need to pass on? No, no, I keep it more? when I stop it. So now I'm stopping. And uh, if I stop it, I just uh, keep the, the, the ability to do it. So I don't know how to how to give to someone else. I say, OK, OK, now I, I'm not anymore. So I don't know who did something, but. Uh... Well, it's an interesting program. The program decides the shot, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hope it won't, it won't stop in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just check with the uh, zero. Uh, because I need, I, I had just some introduction slides to show off uh, first, and then uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Professor Christopher Mathulin. Uh, Christopher, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. How long is the program uh, uh, scheduled for? Yes. Uh, what, what, do, what do you want? No, how long is the program scheduled? This one is it for one hour or? Uh... Yes, I no think worries. Okay, for us, uh, no problem. The problem is to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's okay. Um, okay, so we, we can start if you want. Uh, uh, if you can Alam... share. Yes, no, but I, I, I cannot share my screen. I do not have the authorization. Really, the button doesn't work, so uh, I don't know how to do. Sorry, because in the you beginning, with your hand and like that, you know. Because in the beginning, I, I was able to share my screen uh, when I uh, connected in the first place. So it's it's now it's me. Now. So I think you have to change again because now it's me. Yeah, some someone has to give me the author the authorization to share my screen. One of the the moderator, so, please. I think the, the, the issue is that the screen sharing will be possible only for the presenter. So let's decide. Let Professor Matulin start his presentation. I, As he finishes, the allows the others will be let inside. I will okay. give a brief introduction, uh, Srinivasan. Okay, then let it be you. Yeah. Can can I present now? You know, only uh, Mathilde Gra has a uh, share button effective. It doesn't work have... in, uh, in uh, our computer. I don't know why. Now I don't have. But uh, just wondering what is going on. The racer who uh, gives the authorization to share. Matilde is because okay, sorry, is a, I've got a call from a guy from India. Now. Yes, <laughs> and she is going to allow only one it's only for you. Right? Time. So we got to choose the order of play. Okay, well, so let, the first, let, I told her, Ram sir, you can do the first part. Then yes, yes, Professor Mathurin, and then we can decide yes. who's going to be next after that. Yeah, okay, all right, give it okay, to me. You're on. Yeah, yeah, we'll just give an introduction. What? What happens? Okay, I will just share that. Okay, I see you. All right, can we start? Rajapan? I see very well, huh? Okay. Uh, just uh, 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 greetings from Journal of Hand and Microsurgery. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Terence K. Jero uh, couldn't join on time due to his uh, commitment due to uh, CME teaching program. So he just requested me, my, myself, uh, Dr. Ram Chidambaram, and Dr. Srinivasan Rajapa to moderate this great session of excitement. The title is Current Indication of uh, Wrist Arthroscopy. And we have uh, eminent uh, team. 
from Institute, Institute of Delama from Paris, France. And we have none other than Professor Christopher Mathulet, the hand and upper extremity surgeon. He doesn't need any introduction, but there might be some people who has joined from uh, India and part of Asia for their introduction. He's a hand and upper extremity surgeon, Institute of Delama, Paris, and founder member of European Wrist Orthoscopy Society, but there's now he's branded as International Wrist Orthoscopy Society. He's editorial board of uh, Journal of Hand Surgery, Journal of American Society of Surgery of Hand, the Journal of Wrist Surgery, and many more. And uh, he's very much into teaching, and he has uh, behind the, his uh, uh, brainchild behind his web search, ICAD and international risk uh, uh, centers. Has a, a numerous number of publications, more than 117. And his main uh, prominence is in teaching and training, conducting risk arthroscopy, cadaver demonstration courses all over the world. Uh, we have his uh, excellent team here with us. Same institute, uh, Mathilde de Gras, uh, Lorenzo Marlini, Alam Anot. So we have exciting uh, topics today. And uh, myself, Dr. Ram Chidambra, uh, Director of Institute of Shoulder, Elbow, Hand, and Sports Injuries at MGM Healthcare Chennai. And we have Dr. Srinivasan Rajapa, HOD of Department of Hand and Microsurgery, Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai, India, going to moderate this session. So the title is Current Indication of Wrist Arthroscopy. As you see, wrist arthroscopy is an exciting world and is upcoming specialty in uh, uh, India, uh, but it's very well developed in uh, Asian countries as well as uh, Europe, Europe and US. Uh, I am fortunate enough uh, to learn wrist arthroscopy from the masters. Uh, I mentor Daniel Bach, Professor PC Hall, and Dr. Joe Slade. And in fact, I, I spent about 12 years in UK. I had the great opportunity to do a life surgery course and autoscopy workshop at Epsom with the great giants, including Louis Shecker. And I had been a regular attendance, uh, attendee to PC Ho's cadaver demonstration courses, uh, risk surgery courses at Hong Kong. And I have seen Professor Christopher Mathelin on many occasions. And um, we have his team uh, going to talk about the wrist autoscopy indication. These are all the basic indication on the left side, like diagnostic, debride, excise conditions. And the second is the repair conditions, which has been popular over the last uh, decade, the TFCC repair, ligament repair, assisting to fix fractures and limb corporal fusions. But we are today going to talk about some exciting five topics. First is by orthoscopic suture of scaphoid trash by Dr. Ono followed by orthoscopic bone grafting of scaphoid non-union by Professor Christopher Mathulin, orthoscopic replacement of proximal pole with APC implant. APC is a pyrocarbon implant. Uh, uh, it has been used for the last 20 years, but today we're going to see that how it is being done through orthoscopic technique, followed by orthoscopic bone grafting of intraosseous ganglion by Dr. Lorenzo Merlini, and he's also going to talk about orthoscopic interposition in SLAC2 arthritis. So without much ado, we will start with the program. Uh, could you please hand over the speaker to uh, write to Dr. Professor Christopher Mathulin, please? Okay, thank you. So uh, we'll try, we'll try to share our experience if the system is going to work. Uh, unfortunately, until now, we cannot share our presentation. Alam. Yes. Do you manage to do that? I can't. Uh, hi, everyone. I can't share my screen because the, the I need the authorization to share my screen, please, Dr. Shindambaram. So you can call uh, me maybe, here. maybe, maybe uh, I can start. Yes. Maybe. Maybe I can start. Yes, we could. We could yeah, stop. We okay. could see your presentation. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. So we start with the scaphoid and onion. Where are we in uh, two or twenty one? The place of arthroscopic bone grafting. Uh, so you know the the evolution, the natural history of uh, scaphoid and onion. Mark explained that a uh, long time ago. And uh, uh, the classification of scaphoid non union has, uh, uh, has been well described by uh, our friend Tim Herbert. Uh, it's a useful uh, classification uh, we use in France. We love the Halno classification, but all the world use the uh, uh, Tim Herbert classification, so we are following it. 
a team a long time ago and it was it will be the the start of our uh, presentation uh describe uh, uh, an algorithm with the fibrous non-union you see the percutaneous fixation the mobile non-union with the anterior wedge grafting the sclerotic non-union with the treatment according to age and symptom and in case of avascular non-union the fragmented proximal poor, poor prognosis the salvage or revascularization trial. It was the situation uh, 30, 20 years ago. And you have to understand that, that everything changed the last two decades. So at first we start with the D1 non-union. It's D1, it means there is a non-union. We are more than six months after the fracture, but the uh, scaphoid conserves the normal architecture. So the principle is the same as the acute fracture. The aim of treatment is to achieve accurate articular opposition of the two fragments, taking care that they are correctly aligned and that no malrotations exist. We use the local regional anesthesia, tonicate outpatient surgery, is a very short uh, distal palmar approach. I don't close the, uh, the distal palmar approach. Uh, we uh, the the most difficult period is to place correctly the the temporary cache now, and you have to understand that uh, I, I tried to show you that if you touch the proxim the distal tubercle and dorsally the proximal pole, and you put your wrist in extension, you see that the horizontalization the 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 direction is uh, almost horizontal perpendicular to the to the to the axis of the of the forearm so it means when you have 45 degree of extension is a classical position uh, it could be an help to uh, uh, to put the kawaii's after that you have to enter into the the the, the joint by mid carpal approach and you see that there is a big displacement so you can remove the Wise until the the fracture to leave in uh, mobile the proximal pole. Then inside with the probe and an assistant helping you uh, pulling on the thumb. You can reduce the step by step the pro the proximal pole to the distant tubercle. And after that, you have just to push the wise and to fix it in order to retrieve a normal undisplaced fracture uh which exists uh, classically so you see here is a fresh fracture you see the bleeding and after that you have a good uh, reduction and a, a good stability and you have just to put your car your uh, your screw uh, i uh, i don't uh, have any uh problem uh, with uh, all the screw you can choose the aim is to obtain a good stabilization when uh, you have uh, finished uh, before to uh, tie correctly the screw, you enter into the micropod joint in order to check if the correction and the compression is good. And you see here, it's the same case, it's very, it's very good. After that, you have to check in the radiocarpal joint if, if they get out of the, of the car wire, if there is no uh, part of screw outside, uh, because sometimes it depends even with the normal X-rays. The postoperative management is uh, very simple. If you obtain a good stabilization, you can allow the patient to move with the screw inside. Uh, classically, I put a volar splint between exercises uh, in uh, against the pain and uh, follow up X rays at three, six, and twelve weeks. My series is uh, seventy-five patient, majority of male, uh, young. Uh, in uh, our Parisian practice, we have a lot of uh, sedentaries, more than manual workers. It's logical, uh, but it is no, there is no problem uh, with that. The average age is uh, 30 years old. You see, it's uh, normal. It's a young, young uh, person. And the average period before surgery is eight months. Uh, our follow-up uh, is uh, one year and a half. The time to union is six weeks. 
and we have free non union all in smokers. And uh, uh, I don't have any problem with a smoker only uh, for the treatment of scaphoid non union. If the patient continue to smoke, I refuse to operate on him. That is a contract we have to pass between the patient and the surgeon uh, for this pathology. It's very important because the, the arteries are very small. And uh, every time uh, I had a, a failure in uh, treatment of non union, it was always because the patient was a smoker. So I asked them to stop to smoke uh, three weeks at least before the surgery. After that, they can retrieve the, the smoking after the, the union is not a problem for me, but it's very important. So, in conclusion, provided that the operation has been carried out fast and correctly, the complications are rare. And the use of cannulated screw with arthroscopic assistance is a very good technique. And you can use this technique even in undisplaced uh, scaphoid fracture if you choose uh, to uh, screw uh, fracture. Okay, so the risk graft, uh, I, I enjoy to speak about the risk graft because for me is a very, very good technique. Of course, it's a complicated technique because you have to sleep the patient, you have to hover the graft from the cortical, from the iliac graft. Uh, it's, it's complicated technique you have to open, but it's very good technique and you have to keep this technique in your armamentarium of techniques for the treatment of scaphoid non union because sometimes it could be a great help. So the, you have to follow the rules to uh, 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 empty the, the scaphoid, to put a big graft, a cortico, cancellous bone graft, harvested from the iliac graft, of course, patient, non-smoker, et cetera, et cetera. Diego Fernandez uh, proposes a uh, wedge uh, shaped graft, uh, which it could be a great help if you have a good vascularization of proximal pole, because it uh, is very convenient to uh, to harvest uh, the the right size of the graft, and you put it and uh, you fix it. Of course, it's an open procedure, but it could be an help when you have a large bone defect. The vascularized bone graft uh, has been described by. Uh, the Mayo Clinic in uh, 95, the dorsal one, but you see that the quality of arter, uh, artery is very small and it's complicated uh, to harvest it and to have a good vascularization is the first problem. The second problem is uh, the bone loss of uh, scaphoid is always vola, it's not dorsal, so it's complicated to use a dorsal graph to fill uh, vola bone loss. The lateral uh, uh, bone graft described by uh, Zeidenberg in Argentina is a very convenient graft. And all, every time I have to perform a steroidectomy in a case of slack one, uh, snack one, excuse me, I use this technique because you perform the steroidectomy, you harvest the vascularized bone graft, and you can put it to reconstruct your scaphoid. It's a, it's a win win technique. The Volar Carpentry uh, I re-described, in fact, is a technique described uh, and proposed by Robert Jude, you know, in uh, 1964, a long time ago. Menke was a German anatomist. We uh, described very well the, the distribution of the artery of the, uh, the, the Volar aspect of the radius. Brown in uh, USA, Kuhlman in France, and Kawai in uh, Japan described approximately the same uh, technique. The anatomical background and technical description uh, was made by uh, Max, who was my resident at this period, and myself. Uh, and we found the volar cap artery arise from the radial artery and runs along the volar aspect of the radius in all cases, in branch on the palmar sides of Droge, forming anastomosis with the branch and creating the graft. So the principle of the technique has been uh, well described. It's very simple. We open the, uh, the volar uh, uh, the Vola uh, uh, lat, uh, Henri approach, you retract the, uh, the, the tendon, you flex the wrist in order to relieve the tension of the flexor tendon, you harvest uh, the, the, the graft, the graft is vascularized, and uh, you fresh the end of the scaphoid, and you put the graft inside the, uh, the scaphoid. Yeah, after that, you have to fix the graft after the correction. And you see that the shape of the graft is exactly the same as the shape of the bone loss. 
then you see this case with a very big uh, bon vola bone loss, adaptive disease. In fact, there is no uh, scaphorinate problem, but it's because the uh, the, the the lunate uh, the proximal pole lied on the distal tubercle because there is a humback deformity and there is a correct uh, scaphorinate uh, ligament, the lunate follow the proximal pole and give this uh, uh, aspect. Here you see the treatment, the big graft inside, and after three weeks and after one month and a half, uh, we obtain a, a, a good union. And after six months, you see very good reconstruction, no disease, good aspect. So uh, with Mathilde, we published uh, uh, an impressive series of uh, 100 patients, majority of male, of course, in this case, it was a little uh, uh, oldest, uh, but uh, the, the average follow-up is almost three years, and we obtain uh, union in uh, nine weeks, uh, and we have seven uh, cases of non-union or smokers. Uh, it's always the same problem. But you see this case of non-union, uh, very good uh, reconstruction. Unfortunately, it didn't work as a patient with uh, a great smoker, so it's very important and emphasize this point, but it's very important. So, uh, in conclusion, two uh, 93 percent union in seven weeks, uh, 97 percent of satisfied patient, almost 19 percent excellent, a good functional results. So this technique is a good technique, and we can propose it as the primary treatment of scaphoid non union in some cases. Now we arrive to the arthroscopic bone grafting, which is a, a new option proposed by PCO. Uh, very incredible option. It changed completely our indication now. The principle is to enter into the, the wrist bar arthroscopically. We uh, clean and refresh the bone and the, uh, by arthroscopy in a mid couple approach. Uh, the scope is in a ulnar mid approach, and uh, the instruments are in a radial mid approach. We use the shaver, the curettes. It's very good, very easy. I use the water in order to clean correctly the, the joint, but of course, when you put the graft, you have to uh, use the dry, uh, uh, the, the dry technique uh, uh, to avoid that the, gra the, the, the cancerous bone graft uh, move into the joint. And uh, you see, it's very easy to push the graft directly in uh, to the bone loss area. And uh, after that, now uh, normally uh, PCO use uh, fibrin tissue uh, to glue the the, the 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 graft. But in fact, when you release the tension, the shape of the capitate push on the graft area, so there is no problem. Then uh, you can use a screw if you have a classical waste uh, non union. And uh, I change completely the fixation according to my vision, arthroscopic vision of the, this area, because in fact, uh, the trichotrom, the lunate, and the proxima pole are in the same plan. So it's better to use a scaffolinate fixation for the proximal pole because you fix the uh, distal uh, scaphoid, the graft area, the proximal pole, and the lunate, and you have a very strong fixation. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, until now, I have never, uh, I had never any problem with the proximal pole non union. Uh, you see the series uh, uh, young uh, people, uh, 35 patient, time to union, seven weeks. I have only one non union in a waste case, but uh, I think I was not very good for the waste uh, non-union. I prefer to use uh, uh, the vascularized bone graph when I have a large uh, bone defect. But uh, uh, one of my students who is a good expert now, Jean-Michel Cognier from Reims, is very, very uh, strong for the treatment of uh, the waste uh, non-union, and it obtained a very good result so oh, it's a technical fault for myself it is not uh, the problem of the technique. So you see here, everybody between you know the difficulty to treat uh, this uh, kind of uh, of lesion. And uh, before the before the arthroscopic treatment, it was uh, awful to uh, to obtain union and to obtain a correct uh, correct treatment. And now it's very simple. 15 minutes of surgery, you enter, you put the graft, you fix, 
uh, by a scaffolding aid fixation and you see after 45 days you obtain an union it's just magical and for me it's a solution in all uh, proximal points so the microscopic bone grafting uh, is not seems is a reliable and safe procedure and now particularly for the proximal uh, uh, non-union uh, problem a large theory with a launch for up is requested in order to to confirm this encouraging result, of course, but I can tell you that uh, we are several teams to use this technique, and it's uh, it's it's very good technique. So now, if we compare the proposal by Team Abbott and uh, the situation now, you see that uh, we use arthroscopic percutaneous fixation in stage one D one. For the other cases, we can choose between the arthroscopic bone grafting or the vascularized bone graft according to your feeling, your uh, technical uh, uh, management, etc., etc. For me, every time I can use the arthroscopic bone grafting, I do that. It's especially for the proximal uh, pole fracture. When I have problem, I use the vascularized bone graft, but I keep in my pocket the wrist graft which is a great technique with uh, and could be a great help. Thank you. So, uh, tick, 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 tick. Okay, very good. Okay. Now, uh, the, the big doctor, Ram, <laughs> Yes, could you allow Alam to share his was um uh Sinivasan? Or you want to uh, take some questions now, Christopher? If you have any question, yeah. you can tell uh, I, I have I have few questions. <laughs> yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah, fire away. Uh, it's very interesting, very nice. Uh, somebody of current perspective from uh, your unit. Now, uh, what do you think about uh, dorsal to OLAR approach fixation? It looks like you have moved away from it and then completely managing acute non-union, everything from uh, distal to proximal. Do you ever use a proximal to uh, distal pole fixation at all? Is it necessary? Hey. It's a great question. I see that you have a uh, American formation because uh, <laughs> it is uh, the from I, you. I, I, I know. I, I, uh, yeah, I know. I know. Uh, Joe Slade. Joe Slade. Uh, Joe Slade was a great friend of mine, and yes. uh, I know. I know his technique with that track uh, proximal to this. Of course, is simplest, but it's yeah. illogical. Why? Because you pass through the cartilage. So uh, that that is the first the first thing. So it's always better to use the retrograde fixation because it's less dangerous for the cartilage. But then the other problem in non-union you have a bone loss and the bone loss is volar. Every yes. time, no, never dorsal. And the the humpback deformity is when the proximal pole uh, lies on uh, the distal tubercle. And when you reduce it, the volar bon the bone loss is always volar. So uh, the volar approach is better than the dorsal approach, of course, because okay. it's complicated to fill the scaphoid by dorsally. For the proximal pole, I understand that sometimes you 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 tempted to to uh, you you would like to uh, to to use uh, the proximal uh, fixation, but I promise you, the arthroscopic technique now is very simple. Is really better than all the other option and I encourage you to use this technique. Yes, thank you. Uh, I also question about the fixation after your arthroscopic bone grafting. Uh, after fixation after your arthroscopic bone grafting, because I've seen the uh, PC who doing with the wires, uh, multiple wires from the distal approach, uh, but you have shown us that you pass the wire, K wires to lunate. So, Absolutely. Is that for any reason why you decided to fix the lunate as well? And how long you keep the wires? Ah, uh, six weeks, <laughs> six weeks, eight weeks, depending on the union, of course. Uh, according to the, you know, the the imaging you can have with the X-ray. The the problem is the fixation. Uh, classically, we we learn to fix the scaphoid or me, but uh, when you you have to treat a proximal pole, the fixation of uh, proximal. Uh, uh, proximal portal scaphoid is very complicated by retrograde system and of course 
I agree with you, it's better to do by anti-regret system through the proximal port, but it's dangerous because it's very small, it's very fragile, uh, you uh, damage the cartilage, etc., etc. So you try to fix the better you can. And in fact, when you are inside the joint arthroscopically, you see very well that the the trichotome, the lunate, and the proximal pole are in the same plan. In fact, the scaphoid is a navicular bone, so it turns like that. And we try to fix uh, by a straight car wise, uh, yes. a totally uh, a st a stupid bone. Not stupid, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you understand what? Uh, with the yes, yes. shape of, of a bone, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, with this technique, it's very simple because it's scaffolding fixation. And uh, uh, I, I promise you, it's very simple technique. The well, question is sometimes when you do arthroscopic bone grafting, the uh, healing is not as expected. It can be delayed. So if it is only scaphoid fixation, you might leave the wires a bit longer, I'm told. But if you fix also the lunate, is that also acceptable to leave the wire a bit longer than necessary six weeks? Yes, you're, you're right, you're day. right. You're right, it could be a problem. You're, you're right, you're right. I, I think to avoid that, I, I didn't have this kind of problem because uh, uh, probably technically uh, I'm very... Uh, good for for the treatment of the proximal port the, the you have to respect some rules the first rule yes. you don't operate any smokers yes okay. it is a choice of the patient uh, of course uh, yes uh, is the patient choice so if he accept that he, uh, normally you, you remove 50 percent of problem after that oh. you have to curate and to clean correctly the two ends of bone and arthroscopically is very easy because with the uh, with the scope you can go inside the, yes. the, the fracture and non-union area. You see very well. You clean when it's very clean. You fill it with a good uh, cancerous bone graft and you fill it completely. And after that, with the fixation, the scaffolding fixation, you you have a strong fixation. Normally, normally until now for me it was the same uh, evolution. You Excellent. never have any uh, non-union. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Sinivasan, do you have any questions? Or any other? I don't see any questions in the uh, forum here. No, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so now you have to, you, to you have to allow Alam to Alam Harnout to have uh, the possibility to share his screen. Can you do that? Yeah. Because Can I you see, uh, you know, to my name. Ah, yeah, very good. A, I think, Alam, I think okay, it's please. okay. I think it's yeah. okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, yes please. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is fine. Thank you for the invitation. For So for uh, the next lecture, I was asked to present the uh, arthroscopic dorsal capsule ligamentous repair for uh, the scaphoninate uh, instability treatment. And uh, uh, actually, in the first place, uh, I was uh, supposed to talk about the arthroscopic future of uh, scaphoidinate tear, but uh, I intentionally uh, changed the title uh, to uh, arthroscopic dorsal capsular ligamentous repair, the ADCLR for uh, the scaphoidinate instability treatment, uh, because we'll see that later. We have this modern and uh, current concept of scaphoidinate complex that um, appears to have the uh, main role in uh, the scaphoidinate stabilization. And uh, it is uh, quite admitted uh, nowadays that the scaphoidinate ligament uh, is not the only stabilizer of the scaphoidinate space. And uh, uh, as we can see, uh, for decades, uh, the surgical procedures uh, have, uh, targeting, uh, have targeted uh, the uh, scaphoidinate ligament repair itself uh, uh, many uh, surgical procedures, such as uh, the direct suture, some procedures uh, using anchors have been described, and uh, many ligament FST have been described as well. And uh, I don't have uh, enough time to uh, present uh, all those procedures, but uh, uh, what we can say is that uh, globally, um, uh, the results we can have from the literature show uh, either failure of some techniques or uh, poor functional outcome. 
And uh, what you can say is that the scaphulinate ligament repair is uh, a kind of uh, not really adequate for scaphulinate joint stabilization now. And uh, stabilizing the scaphulinate joint uh, requires uh, uh, the scaphulinate uh, complex uh, stabilization. And uh, uh, I would like uh, first to thank, uh, of course, uh, Professor Matoulin, who uh, described the technique in the first place and uh, uh, operated most of the 700 patients of our series in, uh, in the unit and uh, uh, gave me uh, many data and, uh, to prepare this lecture. So if you can start with uh, uh, some uh, anatomical basis, uh, the scaphulinate interosseous ligament first. Uh, it is uh, uh, traditionally uh, described as uh, divided in three areas, uh, the dorsal area, uh, the volar area, and uh, the intermediate area. You can see uh, in the left side of the screen, uh, the intermediate area. And uh, if you have to manage the scaphulinate instability, we just need uh, uh, to forget everything about this area because it's uh, a non-vascularized uh, fibro cartilage and uh, you don't have to um, uh, perform anything in this intermediate area or to put any suture because it's really uh, useless. And uh, the traditional pattern uh, described the uh, uh, scaphulinate interosseous ligament as uh, uh, the primary stabilizer of the proximal carpal row, uh, which um, now lesions leads to scaphulinate dissociation. Uh, which leads to a DD and finally to slack lesion. But uh, as I uh, told you before, uh, we have this uh, uh, modern and current concept of uh, uh, the scaphulinate concept with uh, all those uh, extrinsic uh, ligaments, uh, uh, the palmar and uh, the dorsal extrinsic stabilizers. And uh, we have many anatomic and cadaveric studies that uh, uh, made the evidence uh, that uh, uh, of the main role of uh, those extrinsic stabilizers in scaphulinate stabilization, especially uh, the dorsal radiocarpal stabilizers, and uh, mainly uh, the DIC, uh, the dorsal intercarpal uh, uh, ligament, which is a dorsal uh, carpal bridge from the trichetron to the SCT joint. And uh, some anatomical studies showed uh, that uh, the section of the DIC from its limited surface uh, leads to a scaphulinated stability. And we have uh, other study uh, that uh, made the evidence uh, that the section of uh, at least one extrinsic stabilizer leads to a scaphulinated dissociation. So uh, we can uh, move to the DCSS, so the dorsal uh, capsule scaphulinate septum, uh, which is this uh, beautiful uh, septum originating from the dorsal capsule and the uh, ligaments. And uh, it attaches uh, the dorsal portion of the scaphulinate uh, to the dick uh, and the dorsal capsule, as you can see here. And um, uh, we have a plausible hypothesis now that uh, the DCSS lesions uh, could be originator of a predynamic chronic dissociation. We can uh, also say a word about the, the uh, muscular ligamentous reflex uh, proprioceptive loops with uh, uh, the main role of the muscular stabilizers in scaphulinate stability, uh, the FCR, the SCU, uh, the ECLR, and uh, who um, uh, seem to uh, play an active role in maintaining the scaphoid position. So as a conclusion for uh, the anatomy, we can say that the scaphulinate ligament is uh, not the only and uh, uh, maybe not even the main stabilizer of the scaphulinate space, and uh, stabilization is provided by uh, the scaphulinate complex, mainly uh, the dorsal radiocarpal ligaments. And uh, I think uh, we shouldn't uh, name the extrinsic stabilizers uh, secondary stabilizers anymore because uh, they probably uh, play a key role in stabilization. So. Uh, the scaphulinate instability uh, requires scaphulinate uh, complex lesion management. It's uh, definitely not a direct repair of the scaphulinate ligament, but it's uh, all about uh, scaphulinate complex lesion repair. And uh, uh, the rationale of uh, the technique uh, uh, we propose is uh, really a capsule to ligament suture, and uh, it uses the capsulodesis effect. <clears throat> uh, how do we do? Uh, the uh, diagnosis now, uh, the, the clinical assessment uh, we check for the clinical assessment, we check, of course, the history of uh, the injury and uh, the clinical examinations um, check the range of motion, uh, grip strength, and the Watson test. 
We also uh, check uh, the uh, associated lesions, the lunar tricatural lesions or the TFCC lesions. For the imaging, we uh, use a plain X-ray bilateral and comparative to uh, check the uh, traditional landmarks, uh, such as the uh, gelular arc rupture or uh, the scaffolding angle. And uh, the MRI uh, can provide an accurate uh, and a precise preoperative uh, uh, diagnosis when uh, we use high resolution and uh, contrast enhanced uh, imaging techniques, as we can see uh, here with that uh, a beautiful uh, diagnosis of a DCSS uh, true, grade three uh, lesion uh, and uh, dick lesion. But uh, what you can say is that the uh, gold standard for the diagnosis uh, remains the arthroscopic now because uh, we can uh, uh, dynamically uh, check and assess the scaphalonate space uh, intraoperatively and we use the arthroscopic uh, uh, classification, uh, mainly the EWAS and the Gessler classification for both. Uh, diagnosis and prognosis. And we can also, with uh, the arthroscopy, uh, uh, diagnose the associated lesions, the uh, ligamentous lesions, and the cartilage lesions. Uh, now, what about uh, the surgical technique? Uh, we uh, perform uh, the procedure uh, as an outpatient surgery, of course, and the setup is a common setup for all wrist arthroscopies. And um, in our unit, we usually use the wet arthroscopy uh, because uh, uh, we uh, want to avoid uh, the tissues burning uh, with the shaver. Uh, the first step of uh, the technique is uh, the uh, radiocarpal assessment. Uh, we uh, perform a we create a three four radiocarpal portal to insert uh, the camera and the six R portal as an instrumental portal. And the first step is a synovectomy to uh, properly check uh, the ligamentous lesions. And after uh, we uh, in reverse the position of the scope and the shaver, and uh, we can uh, check the scaphoninate ligament, which is usually, which is usually about from its scaphoid insertion, as you can see on that video. And uh, the key uh, step of uh, the radiocarpal assessment is really, I think, the DCSS status evaluation. So we, uh, uh, dynamically uh, test the DCSS from proximal uh, to distal, as we can see here. And uh, if the probe is stopped, uh, the test is negative, and uh, we can consider the DCSS uh, as intact. And uh, if it's possible to easily push the probe uh, into the mid-carpal joint, uh, the test is considered as positive, as you can see on that video, and uh, the DCSS is considered as torn. The next step is uh, performed in the mid-carpal joint. Uh, the probe is used to dynamically test the scaphalonate space. And uh, in our routine practice, we use the EWAS classification from the stage one to the stage four. And uh, uh, after uh, we move to the future, the scope is in this six R portal. Uh, we visualize exactly the suture location uh, and we control the passage of the suture across the ligament stump. We use uh, two absorbable sutures uh, which are introduced in the two intramuscular uh, needles. And the first suture is inserted through the three, four radiocarpal portal, and it's very important to insert the suture uh, up to one millimeter from the capsular hole, uh, which has been uh, crea created for the arthroscopic portal. Uh, otherwise, we uh, lose the capsular disease effect. And uh, so the suture is pushed through the radial ligament stud, and it takes uh, 45 degrees oblique direction from uh, dorsal uh, to volar and from proximal to distal, uh, so we can reach the mid-carpal joint. The second suture is inserted par parallel to the first one into the ulnar ligament remnant. And uh, uh, the next step uh, is in the mid-carpal joint. So we put the scope in the MCU portal and uh, we retrieve uh, the suture outside of the joint, as you can see in the video in the middle. And uh, we perform a proximal distal traction, and uh, the node is placed between the scaphoid and the lineage. You can see that uh, on the video on the right side of the screen. And finally, uh, in uh, proximally, we tie the uh, final node in the subcutaneous position. Here is a, a short video from uh, Christophe Matoulin, uh, which uh, summarizes the key steps of the, of the technique. First, the radiocarpal assessment here. 
with the ligaments here. The needle with the 45 oblique direction. We retrieve uh, the suture outside of the, the joint. The proximal distal traction. And finally, the proximal note. In some cases, uh, when uh, the simple technique uh, can provide uh, a satisfactory uh, reduction, uh, we have this modified the technique is very is very efficient. Uh, it is uh, the the principle is to to uh, catch as much capsule as possible um, proximally and distally uh, to increase uh, the constriction of dorsal capsule. So the needle are inserted through two different points, uh, one centimeter apart, and they take two different directions. And distally, we create two entry points into the capsule, so we can tie a knot extra uh, a capsular. And uh, we have to keep in mind that this technique is very uh, efficient and useful, but it's very demanding technically, and uh, it's, uh, the learning curve is uh, long and very important for that technique. Sometimes we have to use uh, some anchors in the cases of both scaphoid when uh, the remnant uh, uh, on the scaphoid side is not enough to uh, put a suture. Uh, the anchor is inserted through the 3-4 radiocarpal portal uh, into the proximal portal of the scaphoid. And uh, we use the suture of the anchors uh, just like uh, in the simple technique. Uh, less often we use uh, key wires when uh, the scaphoid uh, space can be reduced uh, even with a, a modified technique and uh, we introduce two scaphoid key wires and uh, the, we have to reduce the scaphoid space before uh, tying the second node by a tire iron uh, like maneuver as you can see here. After surgery, uh, the wrist is immobilized with a splint in extension uh, it's, uh, for six weeks after future repair. And uh, as you can see here, the uh, rehabilitation protocol has to be uh, very gentle in the first, uh, in the beginning, uh, focused on uh, proprioception. And uh, we do not recommend uh, any uh, stretching exercises in the first week. So at the last uh, review, uh, the uh, theory. Uh, the theory of our units, uh, 600 cases were included, and uh, I think uh, now we have about uh, 700 cases uh, in the theory. The mean age of a patient was uh, about uh, 40 years old, uh, the average follow up uh, three years. Uh, most of the uh, trauma mechanisms uh, were uh, sports injuries, and uh, one third of the patients were high level athletes. And what you can uh, see uh, for the results is that first, uh, the pain improves significantly uh, and uh, uh, on the visual analog scale, it decreases from A to one. Uh, the, the range of motion in the range of motion improves significantly, uh, especially for uh, flexion extension. Uh, uh, the strength uh, improved uh, as well. Uh, from uh, 22 kilo uh, to uh, 44, and the dash score uh, decreases significantly as well. For the post-op myo risk score, um, uh, it was uh, excellent and good in most of 90% of the patients. So all the patients returned to work after an average period of nine weeks. All professional level athletes continued their sporting activity at the same level. And uh, the functional outcome was statistically related to the stage and the delay between injury and uh, surgery. So uh, the ADCLR is a, a simple technique, even if uh, it uh, requires a learning curve. It avoids extensive dissection uh, with a functional, uh, uh, good functional outcomes, uh, especially for the hand workers and high level athletes. And, uh, uh, but in the high grade instabilities and chronic static dissociation, uh, we need to uh, choose alternative surgical technique, as you can see here on this treatment algorithm proposed uh, by uh, Christophe Matelin in the stage four and uh, the stage four plus. Thank you for the attention.
Thank you. So, excellent uh, presentation and uh, very impressive results. I think probably is the largest series on the, the world, over 700 patients. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, any questions, uh, Rajapa, you have? Or anything? I think there is one question, uh, uh, Christopher, I think you wanted to answer. What is the best investigation for suspected injuries, whether it is MRI or uh, CT orthogram? It's a very interesting and important question because even in our team, there is big discussion about that. In fact, it's very simple. You have to understand what is the aim of the CT arthrogram. The CT arthrogram, the aim of the CT arthrogram is to find an hole in a ligament. It means a passage of liquid between the mid-carpal to the radiocarpal joint. Or, yes. So, okay. But we know different things. The first thing we have to know that the intermediate part of the scaffolinate ligament, the interosseous part, is unuseful, is not vascularized, and it can be uh, uh, perforated without any instability. So, if you obtain a positive uh, CT atroscan with a passage of a liquid between the, the ball, the radiologists tell you there is uh, okay. instability. In fact, there is nothing. The second problem is, uh, particularly in young patients, uh, we are programmed to be repaired by ourselves. And uh, we try to create some tissue, particularly dorsally, and we create some tissue, and this tissue block the passage of the liquid. So, in fact, sometimes it's impossible to have any lesion, and the radiologist can tell you there is no problem, and in fact, there is a big instability. It's a false negative. There is false positive, false negative, and it's a painful exam. So, in fact, for me, in 95% of cases, the comparative dynamic uh, MRI gave me the answer. After that, the MRI with a good sound and a good radiologist, we can have almost all the answer and uh, is a less expensive, less painful exam. And uh, the arthroscopy, of course, is a, is a good solution. It's why I prefer the MRI if I have to choose. Thank you. Um... I have uh, one question. Uh, the the EOS classification three into A, B, C types. So depending on that, you recommended in your uh, program in your uh, tabular column saying that you would do all a capsular disease. How do you do, and uh, how easy to do that? All our capsular Alam, it's, disease. Alam, it's for you. Uh, can you uh, please repeat the question? I I can't. Uh... Uh, it, the last tabular column, you showed that uh, the, the type 3 US ABC for the A yes. and B when there is a volar ligament avulsion, volar ligament gap, uh, you said uh, you will do volar, arthroscopic volar capsular yes. disease. How do you do it that? Depends. Actually, it depends of uh, the arthroscopic findings. Is that we have that uh, technical, the surgical technique described by Delpinal. And we can uh, uh, perform uh, the the capsular ligamentous repair in the same patient. But uh, uh, what you can say for the volar capsular ligamentous repairs that uh, most of the time uh, we do not. Um, um, uh, it's not uh, uh, necessary to perform the volar uh, stabilization. Most of the time in our practice, the, dol the dorsal uh, stabilization is enough. I, uh, Professor Matulai, you have some something to say about this? Uh, in fact, you know, it's it's interesting because this morning we uh, we had a very uh, important webinar with uh, IWAS and APWA. Yes, uh, yesterday. And the the question was about the scapulinate only scapulinate injuries, and the and we 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 try to find this. Uh, the, 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 the algorithm and something like that, and it's complicated. Okay, so no, classically, classically, if you have uh, only a volar lesion, you treat a volar, uh, you, you can treat only the volar repair as described by uh, Paco Pignal. Paco Pignal performs a good technique uh, according to mine, it's, it's very simple. Classically, when you have a dorsal and volar, 
when you perform a good suture of the dorsal uh, capsule to the dorsal uh, remnant part of ligament, it's sufficient to reduce the anatomy and normally is not necessary to treat the volar uh, uh, problem. But do we know how uh, frequent are the uh, volar, the unique volar? The, the, the isolated volar? Yes. Less, yes. less than 5%. Less that's, than why, that's why in our routine practice, uh, uh, we uh, quite never see them. But I think, the, I think the, uh, the highlight is that the main stability is from the dorsal capsule and ligament. Uh, and that's uh, that will solve you know, you know, the problem. There, there is a, a, a few rates of uh, volar lesion because classically, uh, when the patient has a problem of volarly, the stability is better, and sometimes, often, they healed uh, by himself without any surgery. Oh, so okay. we cannot see them. We have one question from the chat box. What suture do you use? Is it uh, uh, a bond? I think it is a PBS. You showed right absorbable sutures, correct? Yes, the absorbable suture is the PDS. Uh, is uh, the best suture uh, we have on the market, if I, uh, I can say. But uh, uh, I have some colleagues who uh, uses, uh, use use uh, other suture. Uh, we don't have uh, any data uh, to say one suture is greater than another. It's a, a kind of empirical choice in our team to uh, use the PDS, and it works. Uh, we don't have any okay. problem with that. And uh, you, uh, I, I, get, I guess you use the K wires as a modification, not routinely. Is that correct? Yes, we uh, use a, uh, with the uh, modified technique. Uh, patients, you need to uh, use the K wires to keep the scaphonodate reduction maintained. Do you? Yes. How much percentage you need to do that in your series? Uh, now we uh, use a key wire less and less often because with the modified technique I showed. Uh, when uh, you um, you perform properly uh, the modified technique, uh, we can most of the time reduce the scaphonic space, and uh, you do you don't uh, need to use key wire anymore. So, uh, but uh, we can uh, when we check the reduction uh, when we track on the suture, uh, if the reduction is not satisfactory, satisfactory, you can use key wires, but really uh, rarely. Thank you. You're Excellent. Thank you. Well done. Uh, we move to the next uh, talk, please. Thank you to be Dr. Mathilde Groff. Yes, uh, I, I can share my uh, my screen for the moment. Could you? Uh, yeah. yeah, you Perfect. can. Yeah, now I can. Thank you. OK, is, is that good for you? Yes, yes, please. OK. OK, so. Oh, hello. Is that good for you or not? Yeah, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, Thank you. you. OK, so now I will see the long term results of uh, arthroscopic re replacement of necrotic proximal pole with the uh, FC implants. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a solution for uh, the, the non union of the proximal pole of the scaphoid. The FC implant is uh, uh, a pyrolytic carbon implant which has an anterior posterior large curve, as you can see here and the uh, frontal small curve here. So when you put it, it's uh, very uh, small in the in the anterior posterior, uh, in the frontal curve, but uh, in the anterior posterior, you have uh, um, an implant who really fits in the in the, the place here. The module of elasticity of the of the implant is uh, the same than the bone. And uh, so this ovoid shape, which is uh, really soft, uh, has an adaptability, adaptive, adaptive mobility of the wrist. When you move the wrist, it moves with the wrist and it allows to have a, a good motion. So this technique is uh, performed on uh, outpatient under local regional anesthesia. We put a uh, pneumatic tourniquet, uh, it's under wrist arthroscopy. So we use the three, four portal here. Uh, for the the shiver to remove the 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 proximal pole here, 
uh, and to, to put the implant. So this portal has to be enlarged. We use the four or five portal or, or six air to put the, um, the scope. And we also use the MC air portal in order to check uh, the, the, the implant. So here first we use the exploration of the joint. You can see here uh, the proximal pull uh, of the scaphoid, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, with a non-union, but you see, can see here too that uh, the cartilage, cartilage is safe. So first we start to clean uh, the articulation, so with the shiver here. Then we uh, have to do a section of the scapulinate uh, ligament. Usually the scapulinate is, uh, is safe, so we can use the blade as you can see here. And this is a very important part of the of the the, the surgery uh, because uh, if uh, the scapulinate is still uh, attached uh, at the anterior side, it will be very difficult to remove the the proximal pole of the of the scaphoid. So we can use also the scissors that you can see here. So all the the blade and the scissors are uh, passed through the three four portal, and we really have to cut the scapulinate until the the anterior part. But we have to be very careful not to open uh, the 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 articulation, the joint uh, in the front. Then with uh, uh, forceps, we remove all the pieces, and we may have several pieces, so we re absolutely have to remove all the pieces of the proximal pole of the scapulate. Then we check the size of the implant with uh, the test implant. We have three different sides of test implant. Uh, and you can see here, so there is a, a different color and we can check the size with the, the size of the, of the test implant. And then uh, we, we, we can take the, put the, the final implant. So here we can first try to put the, the test implant which is uh, um, very easy to put. Uh, you just have to push, but it's a, a bit more difficult to remove. So to remove the, the implant, uh, we have a different way. We can put the implant in the, in the finger of a glove. So you can just push on the, on the, the glove. This is a technique uh, I've seen with uh, uh, Philippe Liverno. Uh, another technique is to take uh, forceps, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to remove. So you have to put some uh, plastic on the two legs of the forceps. And then uh, when you have the good size of your implant, you can put the final implant under a scopic control. Uh, you, so you have the scope on the uh, four five and then you push on the three four. So here you can see we, we have the scope on the four five and we push on the, uh, on the implant and you can see here the implant going in. Then here we are in the NCR portal and you can see that the implant fits all the place uh, instead of the proximal pole. At the end of the surgery, we uh, check the mobility and we check that uh, the implant is uh, stable. So we uh, can absolutely do the, an immediate mobilization. The patient, uh, in the same time, if necessary, we can do a radial steroidectomy. After the surgery, we put a protective protect dressing for one week and uh, we, can, uh, we also can uh, put a splint, but uh, uh, only uh, if, uh, if the patient wants to, to keep it, but he can also start to move immediately after the surgery. If any rehabilitation is required, we, we can start it after the third week. So some results, uh, this is a, a, a retrospective study with long-term results. So we checked only the patient under 65 because after 65, uh, everything worked. So we wanted to see uh, what happened under 65 to check for young patient. The study was uh, uh, looked at between uh, 99 and uh, 2006. And we had uh, 15 patients, one loss of follow-up. So 14 patients, all male, with avascular necro uh, necrosis of proximal pole. We checked out the range of motion, the grip strength, the pain, the X-ray, and uh, the long term, the stability of the implant and uh, the, the apparition of a, a, a capillate notch. We also checked the Mayori score and the DASH and the patient satisfaction. The average age was uh, 52.7 years old um, and the average follow-up was 8.7 years. 57% uh, so of the patients were sedentary, and we had uh, almost 43 patients who were manual worker. 
uh, it was the dominant side in 71% uh, uh, of the patient. Half of the patient had uh, a non-union approximately uh, uh, an average delay of 21 years, and the other half didn't know when was the, 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 the trauma. So uh, for the, the, those patients, uh, uh, some of them had previous treatments, so there were two conservative treatments for a gross, uh, gross graft, and one has after that an, uh, another surgery for replacement by uh, silicon, silicone. And uh, uh, for those patients, um, uh, two of the 14 patients had uh, initially a waist fracture and 12 approximal pole uh, fractures. This is a very important point and you will see later on. So uh, for those patients, four patients had a SNAC1, seven, uh, half of the patient had a SNAC2, and three patients had a SNAC3. In eight cases, they were dizzy. So you can see here uh, a clinical case, unknown trauma, patients 42 years old with the avascular necrosis. And you can see here that we have a DZ of the lunate. The patient had the surgery as uh, we already described. So uh, first cleaning, then we cut the scapulinate, remove all the pieces, and uh, at the end push the implant. And you can see the implant in, in, the, in the hole. So after nine hours of follow the patient has no pain, normal motion, and you can see here that the disease was corrected. After the, uh, the surgery, the patient had an uh, immobilization in average 25 days, but all the patient has the option to remove the spleen whenever they wanted. Uh, there were one case of early volar dislocation, as you can see here. It was uh, probably a technical fault, uh, as I told you, when, when you cut the scaffolding. So we have to really pay attention for that to cut completely, but not to, to per do the perforation of the volar capsule. This patient had another surgery. And uh, uh, after 10 years, uh, there is uh, no problem. So here you can see the total functional outcomes, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the patient recover uh, a good uh, um, range of motion, uh, in flexion extension, but also uh, in uh, uh, radial linear deviation, and uh, increase the, the strength from 15.8 to 34.6. The control lateral side, they, they have 44. And the pain decreased uh, also from 7.5 to 0 0.7. So you can see that the, the results are very good. At the X-ray, we had 12 stable implants with five correct, uh, corrected disease. So uh, three disease remained. And we had uh, an apparition of uh, six capitate notch, as you can see here. So here, this is a patient, 40 years old, manual worker, a known fracture. And you can see here uh, a DZ. The patient had the surgery. After two years, uh, you can see that there is a small capitate notch here. And after 10 years, you can see that the capitate notch increased, but the patient doesn't have any uh, pain uh, in front of the capitate notch. And you can see the correction of the DZ here. So uh, the Mayo risk score uh, was 79.6. Uh, uh, and uh, so it was excellent and good in six, uh, two thirds of the patient and average in one third. The quick dash, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the pre-op dash, but uh, the post-op dash was uh, uh, in average 7.6. And there were two failure uh, who were the two uh, unstable implants. And those patients were as a two initial raised fracture. So that's why it's very important to check uh, the size of, uh, of the, the implant. And those two patients had a four corner fusion for one after six months and the second one after six years. Last clinical case, patient 42 years old with a snack wrist, flexion 20, extension 30, and a disabling pain. You can see here that it's totally impossible to reconstruct the scaphoid, which is always the best solution when it's uh, possible. The patient had the surgery as we already described. We uh, clean the, the joint, remove all the pieces, cut the scaphoid in eight ligament, and we absolutely have to remove all the pieces if there, there is uh, several. And sometimes you may have some uh, some bone uh, who uh, disturb who could disturb the, the implant. So we can, with the burr, uh, give a better shape. 
And then uh, we put the implant with a, a radiocarpal control, and then we check uh, from, from the, the midcarpal. So you can see here the test implant, and then the final implant. And here we have the, the, the midcarpal view. So you can see here after three weeks, the, the patient uh, can uh, move, has a good range of motion, and he can play music. And after 11 years of follow-up, he has a flexion 45, extension 60 without any pain. And you can see a stable implant with a good strength and a good motion. So uh, finally, arthroscopic uh, arthroplasty for proximal pole non-union seems a better, uh, a better option than the simple weighting therapeutic option we expected at the beginning, and we recommend it, it especially in proximal pole necrosis, and prob probably it's uh, uh, not uh, uh, an indication for the, the waste uh, uh, non-union. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have uh, any questions? Thank you, Madhuri Gross. Yeah, draw. Um, that's a fantastic presentation. Excellent results by doing this technique, orthoscopic. Uh, I personally learned this from Philippe Bellamier from Nance, uh, yes. visiting him sure. uh, many years ago. And I did quite a good number of these, uh, I call Black Diamond series. <laughs> it is uh, uh, APSI, Amandis, Tepi, PI2. Or we have done good number in uh, England. But after coming to India, I didn't do much. I have done only a few cases because number one, it is uh, we have to import for that particular patient use yet because I gather it has been taken over by Right Medical, but it's still yet to be available officially in India. So I have okay. done a few cases by importing for that specific patient and it's all fantastic uh, result. Uh, and you mm -hmm. have made it very improvised doing it orthoscopic. Now, a couple of questions. When you do open, uh, we normally uh, put it and then because only three sizes available, we have to put it, take it, put it, take it, screen it, make sure that with the trial it is very stable, doesn't dislocate. That technique, that uh, tip is a bit difficult with autoscopic. How, what is your tips on that? Second is, if you feel it, the dorsal capsule weak, when you do open, we can reinforce the capsule. That bit is not there in autoscopic because I, I guess you make a slit and then put it in and then close it. What is your tips on these two points, comparing to open? So for the first question, uh, in fact, we, we check the size we need with, uh, we, we really keep all the pieces of the proximal pole. So we, when we have all the pieces and we check on the table, we check the size uh, of the, the proximal pole to, to try to get the, the good size. And uh, after that, because we are in, in uh, uh, wrist arthroscopy, uh, we can with the burr, uh, if we have some, uh, some uh, pieces of bone who, who could give the implants unstable, we can with the burr good, uh, give a good shape to put the implant inside. Uh, so the, the, the fact to be um, by arthroscopy allows, the, uh, allows us to, to have a better vision and to, to really have, have a good uh, um, uh, um, vision and to, to check and to decide for the size. But uh, as I told you, if we need to, to do a test and to, to try several times, it's possible we can use the test. And uh, the, the, the track I, I use is uh, the, from uh, Philippe, uh, Philippe Liverno. Uh, I put the, um, the implants, the test implants in the finger of a glove. Then you can uh, put uh, the implanted test, and then you just pull on yes. the on the glove, and it allows you to remove it. Otherwise, for sure, it's, uh, oh, it's excellent, very difficult. excellent, excellent tip. <laughs> and okay, if that... it's uh, not possible to do because sometimes, uh, sometimes with uh, the bone, it can make a, a hole in the glove, so you you remove the glove, and the test implants <laughs> stay inside. Yeah. So no the, other, uh, the other tips is from Christophe. Uh, you can take uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, you can take some uh, plastic uh, from uh, uh, any uh, uh, any any uh, thing you you take. Uh, um, 
um, some plastic and you put on the two legs uh, some small piece of plastic on to the two legs of your uh, forceps and then you can remove uh, your, your test implant. It, it's impossible. It's, it's totally possible. Okay, so this is the point. For the second point, uh, usually, usually I used to, to do a stitch uh, with the PDS uh, on the dorsal capsule because as I told you, we enlarge the, the, the three four portals. So the three four portal has to be a little bit bigger because we, we have to, to open it a little bit to push the implant because the implant has to go through the three four portal. So uh, usually I, I do a suture with PDS on the, on the dorsal capsule. Excellent, because your results are impressive. And in fact, I think you have included uh, snack two and snack three stages as well, compared yeah. to what I learned that, you know, is mostly indicated for snack one. And you show very impressive correction of DZ deformity with this. Yes, but the, the correction of the DZ is probably because uh, because when you put the implant, uh, you give a retention of the of the caps of the dorsal capsule. So probably it's the retention of the dorsal capsule who allows to to put the the lunate in in good uh, in in good position. Correct. I can add something. It's very interesting because. Uh, there is a, a, a big change in understanding anatomy and uh, treatment of scaphorinate uh, instability. And uh, in fact, uh, step by step, we discover that uh, probably the, as, as uh, proposed uh, as uh, Mark Ross from Australia, the first stabilizer of uh, the scaphorinate space uh, could be the extrinsic ligaments. It means when you have uh, uh, the, this kind of lesion, arthroscopically, you don't touch anything. You put the spacer, which allow you to reduce the, the, the anatomy, to retrieve a normal anatomy, because there is a spacer between the, the scaphoid and the lunate, and you create a retention of the, the capsular system. It's why there is a good stability. You don't touch to the extrinsic ligament, and it works very well. It's interesting, uh, supporting your concept. Uh, now I have a million dollar question, Christopher. If you have a, if you have a proximal pole avascular necrosis, a patient coming to you, how do you decide whether to go for arthroscopic bone grafting or vascularized bone grafting or go for APSI? Uh, I, I think the question to Mathilde. Mathilde. Yes, uh, we, we put the APSI uh, if it's not possible to. Uh, you have impressive results with all three techniques. How do you choose? Usually, no, it's, it's... We, we put the FC if it's not possible to, to, to reconstruct, but in fact, it depends also of the, of the patients, because when you put an FC implant, it goes faster. So if the patient can uh, wait to have a healing and everything, uh, it's good to try to reconstruct all the time when it's possible. We always try to reconstruct, but if uh, uh, it's not possible, we we can't do the reconstruction. So we have to find another solution. Before the other solution w would have been to uh, to do a first row carpectomy, or but now with the APSI implant, we have another solution who allows not to remove all the the, the first row carpectomy. So it's an, another solution when it's not possible to reconstruct. But in some cases, we may have also some patients who say that it's not possible for them to uh, wait uh, to obtain a healing of uh, uh, non-union. Non because we know that non-union takes a little bit more time than uh, uh, first uh, fracture. So sometimes, in some cases, even if it's possible, but the patient don't uh, can't wait or don't want to stop to uh, to smoke because when you have a patient who smoke, uh, for as uh, Christoph told you several times, it's uh, impossible to to uh, think that we will have a healing. So if the patient is a smoker, maybe we will forget the 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 grafting. Uh, so it depends on the patient on what he needs and uh, the time he has and uh, if it's possible to reconstruct or not. So the, I, I can add something. It's very important to understand that you see our series. We have a very large series for scaphoid reconstruction, for scaphoid non-union treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
is there is four cases. I mean, uh, we started yes. in 2000, we are in 2021. In 21 uh, years, we have almost two or three cases a year. It means that is very rare indication because every time you can reconstruct the scaphoid, it's always the best solution, always. Thank you. I Okay, just one uh, one other last question. Uh, if the, the main uh, the advantages are many fold with the pyrocarbon implant complaint compared to all the other salvage operations. The only concern is always the dislocation or instability rate. And uh, it is said that the instability usually happens in first three months. Is that the is, uh, case in your case series? And which direction was the instability? Because you showed one case where it was polar. One case was uh, uh, was after one week, uh, so we we knew it very very uh, uh, very quickly. And the second case were uh, was later, uh, but uh, we we had only two cases of uh, of dislocation in uh, in this series. Uh, so it's difficult to tell you always or never because we still can't. <laughs> we we can say all the time, but uh, uh, usually when you have dislocation. Uh, because it's uh, almost the same that if you do uh, in open uh, in open, but usually it's more uh, at the beginning. After that, if you don't have dislocation, it's it's supposed to be stable. But we had one case who, who were really quick after the surgery, and the second was uh, second one was later. So, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, we'll just move to uh, Dr. Lorenzo, Ms. Ms. for the two talks together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So. I will start the, the first talk, which uh, is about the arthroscopic treatment of um, lunate bone ganglion. Um, can you see the screen all right? Yes? No, yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. So um, this technique is, um, I like very much this technique because it's the perfect, one of the perfect uh, example uh, of something that is very difficult to treat in an open fashion and actually very easy to treat uh, arthroscopically. So um, not much uh, info about the net uh, I, I know, uh, I suppose you know that it's a quite rare uh, pathology, but it's uh, something that you should always look for in a chronic painful wrist uh, with a, a pain uh, located on the dorsal aspect of the lunate. Um, and uh, usually the diagnostic is uh, Pretty straightforward with the with the imaging, very simple imaging, um, with uh, plain uh, X-rays that will show the cyst, the ganglion, uh, which is usually located on the radial aspect of the lunate, uh, as you can see here. Um, and of of course, uh, you can do a CT examination, which will be more precise about the location of the ganglion into the um, the lunate. And as you can see, this is one of uh, another example where the, the ganglion is located onto the radial aspect of the lunate. And that's uh, all the problematic here because usually when, when you have an intraosseous lunate of the of the uh, a ganglion of the lunate, it's usually painless unless it breaks into the scaphalunate joint. And that's when it becomes usually uh, painful. Uh, we know now also that there is an association between the synovial soft tissue ganglion of the of the wrist that we commonly see on the on the dorsal aspect of the wrist and uh, we know several studies have, uh, have shown that there is a, a common origin between the soft tissue ganglion and the lunate intracellular ganglion so you, sh you should uh, be prepared to do also soft tissue um, um, technique if necessary so our indication is the, of course, a symptomatic ganglion, and as I said, it uh, it's the case usually when the the, um, the ganglion um, breaks into the SL joint, as you can see here on an arthroscopic image. And uh, this is the technique; it's a very simple technique. And um, the the highlight of this technique is that we we do our approach through the proximal portion of the scaphalunate uh, ligament, which uh, as a as a, uh, it was said by the Christoph uh, right before the uh, the first uh, topic. It's uh, a useless uh, portion of the uh, scaphoid ligament, so it's absolutely no problem to 
uh, debride it and to uh, use it as a as a portal to directly access the the, um, the ganglion of the lunate. So the first step is here. You have the the optic, the scope in the one two portal, and that way you are facing directly the um, radial aspect of the lunate. And by your three four portal, you insert a needle that will help you to locate the proximal portion of the scaphoidal ligament. So you only need two portals, the one two and the three four. When once you have uh, located the, the proximal portion of the scaphoidal ligament, you can start to debride it. Uh, with a shaver, and then you will directly access the ganglion. Um, and by this uh, portal, you can directly curate and um, empty the, the cavity of the ganglion. And then uh, you will put your trocar, which is already filled with the graft, directly through the 3 4 portal into the ganglion and pack your graft into the cavity and to to obtain a, a good packing of the graft like this at the end of the procedure. So for this, we have this uh, very useful instrument, which is the Jamshidi Trocar used for bone marrow biopsy. And uh, you, we usually start the procedure with this. So we, we, we do a small incision of the, on the dorsal, uh, on the, I'm sorry, on the distal ridges. And we harvest the graft directly into the distal ridges with the Jamshidi Trocar. So that way your uh, graft will already be inside your uh, your Jamshidi Trocar. And then you move into uh, arthroscopy. You do your 3-4 and your 1-2 portal. The scope is in the 1-2. You're facing the radial aspect of the scaffolding ligament. You identify the proximal portion like this by the 3-4 portal, and then you debride it with a shaver. And you will access the cavity that you can curate still by the 3-4 portal. And at this time, if you're doing wet arthroscopy, you should uh, cut the water and so that the, the, the graft is, uh, is not taken away by the water. And you see, you put your trocar directly into the ganglion and you put and you pack your graft um, directly into the cavity until you have a good packing, good compression and good filling of the cavity. And that's it. At the end of the procedure, we put a small splint, which is more uh, of a comfort splint for a few weeks. And these are our uh, results. So you see, we have uh, now 34 patients with a mean follow up of four years. And uh, this one is a clinical case of typical uh, lunate bone ganglion, which is open to the SL joint, very painful. And this is an MRI with a four year follow up. And you see a very good healing of the bone into the former uh, ganglion. This is the, these are the results. So we see we are very efficient on the range of motion, on the grip strength, and most of all on the pain and on the dash cores, which are uh, very enhanced with this technique. This is another clinical cases um, with the soft tissue association, as you can see. And um, once again, the imaging after two years uh, show a very good healing of the bone and no more uh, recurrence of the form of the of the ganglion. So in conclusion, this is a very uh, simple technique. Actually, you can you can do it in the very beginning of the learning curve in research arthroscopy. It's very safe, very re reliable. The two portals you only need two portals, and, and um, the one, two, and the three, four, and are very convenient for this uh, for the for the grafting of the lunate bone ganglion. And it works. The long the long term follow up shows very uh, very good results. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. There you go. I'll stop the sharing. Do you want me to move to the next presentation or do you want me to stop for questions? We are alone now. Yeah. 
you you can maybe finish your next presentation okay i'll move to the next presentation no yes you can please do all right so i will try sorry there we go so the next talk is about the arthroscopic interposition uh radiocarpal interposition of uh, tendon for slack two wrist very elegant technique that was described by our dear mentor christophe matula there you go all right so the arthroscopic interposition arthroplasty for slack two so as you all know the slack uh, two uh, stage is when you have a full osteoarthritis between the radius, distal radius, and the scaphoid. And the idea is to of this technique is to create something that could allow us to avoid more aggressive uh, procedures, such as the for uh, the proximal uh, row carpectomy or the forebone fusion. And so this idea is to create a a more or less salvage procedure, but that could buy us some time for, especially for young uh, and active patients. So there are mainly three steps in this technique. The first step is to create a wide uh, radial stylectomy, and you have to remove all the scaphoid fossa um, from the radius. The second step is to perform an arthroscopic dorsal capsular ligamentous repair with the same technique the modified technique that was presented by uh, Alain Marnaut um, uh, previously. The goal here is not to repair the SL ligament, of course, but it's to just to stabilize the lesions and to prevent any aggravation of the of the instability between the scaphoid and the lunate. And the third step is to uh, create the interposition of the of the tendon with using the palmaris longus uh, between the radius and the first row, and especially with the the scaphoid. So this is the first step. You, you have the scope in the three, four portal. You have, um, you can identify your one, two portal and use the one, two portal to create your stylectomy, which is a bit wider uh, stylectomy than in classical cases because you have to remove um, the whole uh, osteoarthritis uh, area of the radius. And once you have uh, created a good space on, the, on your former uh, scaphoid fossa of the radius, then you can put your anchor, we use uh, here an absorbable anchor into the radial styloid through the one, two portal. So that's the, the pre-hole of the anchor here. And here the arrival of the anchor through the one, two portal into the radius. And this anchor will be used to uh, fix and to secure your uh, tendon at the end of the procedure. There you go. Then the next step is to harvest the tendon. We usually uh, do the harvesting at the end of, of the at the beginning of the procedure, usually with a stripper, which is very easy to do. Then you have to stop and um, your interposition and um, stabilize the SL uh, instability. So for that, we use the large uh, capsular ligamentous repair, uh, the modified technique described by Alam uh, on the first topic. So no more surprise here. And then we move to the interposition of the palmaris longus. So basically, we end up with a, um, with a two strands. Um, one will be volar and um, one will be dorsal the the trick is to for the volar brand to re-enter the joint um ulnarly to the um, long radial lunate ligaments so you have so you will have a good interposition on the volar side of the radio scaphoid fossa and the other will be uh, be uh, put forth and back between the three four and the six r portals uh, first in particular then between the capsule and the extensor, and then once again back into uh, the joint through the 6R from, um, from the 6R to the 1, 2. So you will have a good interposition on the dorsal side of the radio scaphoid fossa. So the final aspect is very satisfactory with a good interposition of the palmaris longus 
um, onto the former area of the osteoarthritis. So these are our results. Um, you see the first patient were operated in 2008. Now we have uh, 130 patients operated on the last 12 years. Um, we have done a few cases of SLAC3, but the most commonly uh, indication is the SLAC2 technique. We see that the patients are a bit, uh, quite younger, around 50 years of age. And this is typically uh, the pre-op uh, vision of the x-rays and the post-op, you see, after even after a longer follow-up, we still have a preserved radioscaphoid um, space uh, after the stylectomy and the interposition. The range of motion is not so bad also, as you can see. And the pain, we are also very efficient on the, on the pain and on the strength the grip strength of the wrist. This is a mean follow-up of five years and with the longest follow-up of 12 years for the first patient. Which is also interesting is that uh, by stabilizing the scaffolding um, the scaffolding instability, even though we, we do not seek to um, completely restore the anatomy, we just uh, want to uh, prevent any aggravation, well, even though we don't do a full um, complete repair, it's still a very good um, way to restore the, the stability between the scaffolding between the scaffold and the lunate and to um, almost create a normal uh, functioning of the first row. Um, the complication of this technique, we have a few cases of CRPS like any other technique, and we have a, a rate of failure, which is about 9%. Um, of people that we have to um, reoperate it. Uh, so it means that uh, more than 90 patients of the uh, of these patients, um, well, we avoided any uh, more aggressive surgery like first row caprectomy or uh, forebone fusion. And most of the failures actually were uh, patients that were stage SLAC3 so that uh, also presented um, mid-carpal osteoarthritis and probably there was indication that were less uh, pertinent than the SLAC2 wrist. The cosmetic result is of course uh, very satisfactory because we don't uh, do any incision, we only have the small incision of the wrist arthroscopy. And this is an example of uh, one of the first patients operated, you see, and we have a good restoration of the radio scaphoid uh, space, even though we have a very long follow-up, more than 10, uh, now it's a 10 years follow-up. And you see that this guy was operated, Christophe <laughs> Maturin, he was the first, one of the first operated, and you see that he doing very fine and only have a small pain after three hours of highly intense uh, bicycle training. So in conclusion, you see that it's a, it's a good indication for SLAC2 technique, especially in patients where you want to avoid more aggressive technique. And it seems to, good, to give uh, satisfactory at mid-terms uh, follow-up. And now we have to wait how long it can, uh, it can hold into the future. So thank you very much. Dr. Lorenzo Merlini, so that is an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, impressive results for a difficult problem. Yeah. Uh, because the, all the salvage uh, procedures are uh, not even comparable, isn't it? So it's nice, nice yeah. technique. And you, you often say simple technique. It is not simple technique as I see. <laughs> the, the first one with the uh, lunate bone grafting is quite simple technique, actually. But the interposition yeah. technique is, is more, more complex, difficult. But, uh, Yes, very elegant demonstration. Uh, is that possible to do this uh, by open method at all? The technique with the interposition? Yes, just asking. I believe it is, yes, but I think uh, you you lose all the interest of the technique if you do it openly because uh, it's a technique where you can preserve all the extrinsic ligaments and uh, as said Christoph yes. Matumandad before. Because as you, you said, as you said, you preserve the extrinsic ligament, capsule, dorsal capsule, etc. 
then you created yeah. a space and it looked like very impressive results and you have not burned any bridges. So I think it's an excellent exactly. method. Exactly, that's, that's, the, that's the main yeah. advantage of this technique is to preserve all the bridges that you can use in the future if necessary. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, I think any questions here? No. Any questions, uh, Srinivasan? I think the uh, sometimes you see an intraosseous uh, ganglion in the lunate, uh, but the patient has mild symptoms, occasional. So when do you decide uh, that to go for an invasive procedure to bone graft? Basically, right. do you go guided by the symptoms only or by the size of the lesion in the lunate? No, it's uh, only guided by the patient. If the patient is uh, is painful enough to demand a surgery, then that's that's our cue. Um, it's uh, or if we have an imaging that shows that we have an already large um, perforation of the ganglion into the scaphalonate space, then probably it will be also a motivation to go uh, surgically. But mainly, it's the uh, it's the demand of the patient. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, I don't, <clears throat> I don't see any more questions there. Uh, any comments you want to make, uh, uh, Christopher Matulu? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, to share with you all our techniques. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you a lot for organizing the, this uh this meeting and I would like to congratulate my team because uh, they were very excellent and uh, you know uh, I can I, I can be retired now because I'm confident on the uh, of, uh, my <laughs> success <the> legacy <laughs> and uh, I have a great team surrounding me and uh, it's uh, very uh, convenient for me so I would like to thank you I hope that we can share a, a great moment together in a next future close yes. future I hope Real, real uh, future uh, in reality. Have, have a good, uh, have a good evening and uh, thank goodbye. You, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, uh, the, thank you for sharing your excellent talks. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Very nice. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.